Okay, uh, as you can see, I'm filling in for the great Sebastian Gumbel. And I hope I have all the tech stuff set up properly. I'm going to try my best. Um, Vaishev is our portion today. I, we're going to be doing, sort of following the, um, the Aliyah summary. Let me see this for just one second. Uh, I printed this out, but if you go to Chabad uh, and go to Vayishev Aliyah Summary, uh, you can pick that up and follow along with us. And if you were here, you would have lovely cookies. What kind of cookies are those? Amish sugar, Amish sugar cookies. Sorry. If, if, you, if you were special and you came here, you would uh, be able to see that. Oh, I'm special. They look fantastic. I'll have mine later if you... I, I would like, yeah, if you don't... Uh, they really look nice. Very good. I'll try after class. Um, we, uh, we thank Hashem for this, be able to study Torah and the great opportunity that even the Daniel uh, prophet, uh, Naveen, uh, Daniel, prophesied that says that the, um, the knowledge will increase and... I was just commenting to my wife that on my mobile phone all day long on Facebook are tour classes all day long you just it's it, there's rabbis from all over the world people that are teaching Torah and literally any time of the day I can just scroll through and find somebody else giving a, a, a short lecture and what an age we live in I mean this is phenomenal so uh, so we bless Hashem and thank Him for His Torah. Um, we're going to be doing the Aliyah summary. As a matter of fact, can I get one of the uh, summaries so that I can just refer to it, just in case? <laughs> I printed it out. And, uh, obviously, this is uh, this Aliyah is um, about Joseph's life all the way up to the time he is put in prison. And um, it, it starts off by saying that, that Yaakov settled in the land of his father's soul journey in the land of Canaan. These are the chronicles of Yaakov, but they talked about Joseph. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, what, is what, did, what did they mean when they say the chronicles of Yaakov? Basically saying, look, this is about Yaakov settling the land and then how his sons were to settle in the land, and then what actually took place. This was a very monumental event in Yaakov's life. It says that he, he intended on settling. The Hebrew word here actually meant that he, was, he wanted to find his peace. He wanted to settle in peace, just have that uh, as um, an opportunity to not just be a stranger in a strange land or a sojourner, but one who settles and settles in peace. The only problem is Yaakov doesn't have much peace, does he? Why do you suppose that the righteous rarely have peace? Because their peace will be in the future. Very good. Their peace will be in the future, in the world to come. And so it says, I think, uh, I think Rashi says, he says, are the righteous not satisfied with what awaits them in the world to come, that they expect to live at ease in this world too? So maybe your struggles in your personal life, whatever it may be, you should say, wow, maybe, maybe I'm righteous enough to have a good place in the world to come. Maybe that's the reason why that I go through difficulties. And it's funny, we generally look at everyone, I mean, look across the table from everybody here, people we see. And we generally don't see the struggle that they go through. Because many times we carry, carry them very privately and we don't vocalize them. And, you know, it, it is important to, to know that, that a, a righteous person has to struggle in this world. Uh, that's just part of your life. I, I don't know that you can ever, ever opt out. I'm just trying to figure if you could ever go to a shim and say, I, I just... I'm opting out. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, suffer-wise. I go through difficulties. I'm not sure that that'll happen. I'm sure he'll change things around somewhat because 
He's not cruel and vindictive. He's not doing it to be cruel. He's doing it for preparation of the world to come. So in the first Aliyah, Yaakov and his family settles in Canaan. Canaan. All the sons, Yaakov favored Joseph, the firstborn of his deceased beloved wife, Rachel, and he made for him a special robe of fine wool. Joseph's brothers were jealous of the favoritism. Let's talk about the favoritism for a moment. First of all, I am not in any way, and I don't believe the sages of blessed memory, are attempting to justify sibling favor favoritism. Because I think that as a whole is terrible tragedy. Uh, my wife and I have talked about that on many different occasions and observing it in other families. And it is so obvious that it takes place. It's hard for me to comprehend it because I've never experienced it in, in a family situation. But there are other people who have experienced it. Uh, I would think that this concept that says that Joseph was born in Jacob's old age, the child of his old age. There are some interesting commentary on this. And let's track back a little bit. Why did Yaakov love Joseph so much? Joseph was still a 17-year-old, sort of immature young man. There are commentaries that says that he primped and made himself look good like every 17-year-old boy does, combing his hair. Oh, some. There are some that still smell like house mice. But, but in general, fixing their hair. I remember my eldest son one day came home. They, he was in the growing his hair long phase. I don't know if most boys seem to do that around what 17 so he grew his hair real long and he showed up at the house and someone at school had braided his hair into cornrows you know what i'm saying <laughs> cornrows i don't know if you know what cornrows is but oh, yes. generally only african americans can do that successfully i don't know who did it but it was it was actually really good but at the same time i'm like no way are you going to wear that tomorrow? What did he end up doing? If he decided to take it out, he was like... <laughs> yeah, he took it out and his hair was like a fro, afro. But the whole point was, is much like my son, uh, Joseph, that kind of primped a little bit. And his brothers were annoyed by him. But what, what set Joseph apart was this. Yaakov, if we'll remember, let's go back a couple of portions. During Yaakov's... Uh, journey from his father's home to Le Levan's home. He stopped by the academy of Shem and Aver, and there he studied for some some period of time. And knowing that when J J Joseph was born, knowing that Joseph was going to have to go into exile, but he didn't know when, he didn't know how, he didn't know what it was going to look like. He poured himself into his son Joseph. Not only that, but Joseph's grandfather was still alive during this time. And when Joseph was growing up, he spent most of his young age in his grandfather's tent learning Torah. So he was actually learning Torah, not from a student, but the master himself. And so that made him at some level a very, very uh, knowledgeable young man. And so knowledgeable, come on in, make yourself comfortable, it's good to see you. Uh, so knowledgeable that that um, he still had immaturity issues, right? You know, just because you're knowledgeable doesn't mean that you don't have life experience enough. And it, it talks about how um, he has a dream that he wants to relate to his brothers. And what was the dream associated with? What was the first dream? Do you remember? The sheaves, right? Mm -hmm. So he said, well, we're all out in the field and we're, we're doing the wheat or what, harvesting wheat. And all of the sheaves fell down except for mine, and mine stood up straight. And all of yours bowed down to my sheaves. Now, already knowing that his brothers were a bit annoyed at him, you would think that Joseph would have just kept his peace. But being a petulant young man that he was, figured that if I tell them that one day I'll rule, they'll treat me better. Because they realize, oh, he'll be a ruler over us one day, or he'll be in charge, and we better treat him nicely. Doesn't that sound like a teenage boy? You're going, you know what? One day I'm going to be the boss, and they're going to have to follow my orders. 
He didn't think about the fact that he just inflamed the situation and made it even worse. He says, um, the, um, sorry about that, folks, on live stream. Uh, could, you send, could you please send her a message and let her know to not call me? You're buying lunch today? <laughs> I must be buying lunch. <laughs> I'm live streaming, and my, my, my daughter calls. We call every morning. Please call her as soon as possible. Every morning at this time, I call and talk to my grandchildren, Levi and Rachel. And so she's trying to get a hold of us because I haven't called. And so hopefully my wife will call her soon enough. So sorry about that, guys. You got right in the middle of my own personal family issues. And it's funny because my, my daughter and son-in-law said that my two grandchildren, uh, Levi and Rachel, when the phone rings, and they hear my voice or hear Melanie's voice, immediately they start laughing. And so they get the, got the biggest smiles. They say they don't do it to anybody else that calls. It makes me feel good. Of course, they think their grandmother and grandfather is a phone, a mobile phone. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when we actually show up, they probably won't be that excited. Like, who are you? <laughs> right. Okay, uh, back to the, to the, to the discourse. Um, Okay, so I wanted to read this uh, in reference to verse 2. At the age of 17, Yaakov was 108 at the time, and Isaac, Isaac, was 168 years old. He lived for another 12 years. This incident occurred nine years after Yaakov returned home, according to the traditional dating of Leah dying about this same time. Now, it says that he calls... Um, it says the, the word youth in verse 2 says these are the chronicles of Yaakov. Jacob at the age of 17 years was a shepherd with his brothers by flock, but he was a youth with the sons of Bilha and the sons of Zelpa. This refers to uh, the fact that he is slightly immature. This is where we get the idea that he primped and was a typical 17-year-old young man. Um, the, the text says that since, uh, let's see, see, let's go on over to verse, I'm trying to see if there's anything that we missed with the dream, real quick, just to see. Um, One thing that I have read mm -hmm. is that... Um, Jacob uh, knew that these were prophecies and that this was going to happen, right. but in order to calm the situation with the brothers, he tried to discount the dreams. Right. Because when he said, uh, well, uh, when the sun and moon would bow down to him, he mm -hmm. said, well, you're, basically, well, your mother's dead. This can't be a real this dream. A this is a prophecy. But he right. really knew it was. Right. But he was trying to diffuse the situation right. with the brothers by saying, no, don't put any... Right. Credit to this right. dream. Uh, absolutely. V very good point. So we understand in, in our study of the Ram Chal's uh, book, The Path of the, of, of the Ju I'm sorry, Dar Hashem, um, we're in the thing about prophecy right now. And one of the things that we learn is that a true prophet is able to distinguish these things. When he has dreams and visions, he knows uh, that it's prophecy because of the power of the experience. It was very very powerful moment. At the same time, his father, uh, knowing the situation, either on purpose or not, said, sort of downplayed the whole thing so that he could see, uh, you know, so there wouldn't be any other issues. But it says at the end, right, that mm -hmm. he kept the matter in mind. He kept the matter in mind. And, mm -hmm. words, <coughs> and that's found in verse verse 11, so I just want to refer to that. It also, excuse me, it also said in the commentary that uh, what Jacob uh, didn't take into account was that the mother was referring to Bill because after right. Rachel died, she basically raised Joseph and right. Benjamin. Right, absolutely. So, uh, have we, let me try to figure out, did he make the coat of, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the coat. I wanted to mention something about the, the coat of fine wool. Uh, there is, uh, there is commentary, I'm thinking Rashi quotes Ankylos, I'm thinking, I'll have to find it, but the tunic in which he made, um, 
It says the fine wool into the trans the translation follows Rashi, a garment of fine wool. It was long sleeve embroidery tunic made of various colored strips of wool, fine wool. The tunic was a mark of leadership. This is one of the issues that was caused for after Reuben uh, discredited himself by tampering with Yaakov's bed. Yaakov uh, elevated Joseph to the status of firstborn and made him the tunic to symbolize a new position. There's also a Midrashic commentary that says that this was actually Adam's coat that it belonged to Adam and it had been passed down from generation to generation, which even brought more strange reaction from the brothers to think, how can you get, you're, the, you're one of the youngest kids <laughs> and you're going to inherit one of the most prized possessions that we have. Because um, there's also, Adam's, Adam's cloak is also um, re is referred to, and I'm not really sure how, but in the story of Esau and, and uh, uh, Jacob and Esau. But then how would that tie in later if, it, if they considered it such a valuable thing I know. and they were willing to, to destroy it? Yeah, I don't know. That, that, that is some mystical thing that we don't really understand. There's something about it, but who knows? Well, they were envious. Right. They were absolutely envious, so maybe, maybe, maybe that's part of the problem. And I, re I read that the, this type of robe was um, symbolic of rulership. Right, and that uh, kings and their firstborn heirs war something, wear, yeah, yeah. very clothes. good. So in the second aliyah, Joseph's brothers were already tending the father's sheep when Yaakov was uh, sent Joseph to see his brothers, and the flocks were f uh, firing. When Joseph's brothers saw him approach, they plotted to kill him. Reuben, however, implored them not to shed blood, advising them instead to cast him into one of the nearby pits. Reuben's plan was then to later to return and rescue Joseph. We will revisit this in the story later when Reuben and, and Joseph have uh, this meeting after Joseph rises to power. Uh, there's going to be a re reminder like if, if he would have known that Joseph would have been in this situation, he would have not waited to go back and get him. He would have, he would have kept this thing from happening. So uh, let's go over briefly just a few highlights in Joseph. Joseph goes... And he's going to Shechem, right? Uh, traditionally, as a matter of fact, I heard um, um, I, I, I'm losing the name of the rabbi, uh, but uh, I heard him say that when he was in Israel, that um, he spoke to shepherds, and they were actually in the traditional same place that Joseph's brothers were at. And they said, no, this is just, you know, this has been part of history. We start in Shechem and we move and we go north. I mean, this has been part of their tradition for the longest of times. And so even Joseph's brothers were following that same sort of pattern of how you take care of the sheep. However, they, it said that they had went, went away to conspire and to consult uh, the law to find out how they could dispense of Joseph legally. This wasn't a murderous plot, if you understand. They were, they were looking for a legal way to get rid of him. Joseph's, uh, Joseph's uh, indictment against them is that they had, um, he had assumed that they had done something inappropriate according to Noatic law. It says that you don't eat, eat an animal that's been alive, and it was talking about a calf that had supposedly been born. I don't know if you know about that, but there's that's a delicacy to get a calf that's not been born yet, kill the mother and pull the calf out, and you eat the calf. Uh, I don't think that that's kosher in any way. But the idea is uh, he assumed that that's what happened because of what he saw, and he goes back to tell his father, or was going to go back and tell his father, and they, they figured, no, we weren't going to do this. So they put him in the pit. Um, the, um, uh, th let's see if there's anything on this. Uh, let's go over to... It says in verse 18, they saw him from afar. Come on in, come on in. Make a, yeah. You're looking... Yes. I tried to get a Bible, but uh, 
in a different language like Ladino? Right, right. I don't think. Because I'm in online. And yeah, I don't think we have one here. But if you go to Amazon.com, you'll be able to find it there, no problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Have a good day. Um, it says they conspired against him to kill him. First, they tried to cause his death from a disease, a, a distance by shooting arrows at him so they would not kill him with their bare hands. Then they incited dogs against him, reasoning that eh, maybe the dogs could kill him and we wouldn't have to have anything. This is court of Midrash and Rambam. Uh, Sforno renders the phrase differently. They regarded, they regarded him as conspiring against them to kill him. So they were saying, well, I think he's out to get us. Now, what we learned is actually Rashi says that Joseph showed up all happy and he had no clue. Here they were thinking Joseph is going to rule over us. He's, he's conspiring to get rid of us. In reality, he shows up as a guy who sees no gall in anyone, kicking up his heels, laughing, giving big hugs, and his brothers are like, what's up with this? Right? So they are conspiring. Um, it says, um, this explains how the brothers who were so historically righteous that their names would be engraved on the Kohen Gadol's breastplate could have contemplated murder. They were convinced that Joseph was the aggressor and that they were the victim. They were sure that he had come to find fault with them, which he would have when reported to Yaakov in hope that Yaakov would curse them. If so, he was the danger to them and they had the right to defend themselves against maliciousness. An interesting twist you never thought about, did you? Let's look at the third Aliyah. The third Aliyah is going to deal with Joseph arrived and arrived and his brothers immediately stripped him of his fancy robe and cast him in the pit. Upon Judah's advice, they subsequently sold him to the Ishmaelite caravan uh, traveling to Egypt, who in turn sold him as a slave to Potiphar, Pharaoh's chief butcher. Meanwhile, the brothers dripped, dipped Joseph's robe in blood and showed it to Yaakov who assumed that Joseph was devoured by a wild beast. And, of course, he started his 22 years of mourning. Uh, Miss Betty and them went yesterday to go see their grandson's grave and place stones upon it as a memory. And uh, I can only imagine what it would be like to lose a child. And so ya Yaakov figured this is what has happened. Um, the... The caravan. It says that Joseph was spared because he was a righteous young man, that God spared him the, the, the uncomfortable uh, journey to Egypt because normally the caravans carried some type of pot, tar and pitch that was just obnoxious smelling. And uh, instead they were carrying actually herbs and good smelling spices and and he was able to go to Egypt uh, in, a, in a little bit more comfortable manner, you know. Chained. Yeah, chained and bound and, yeah, exa exactly. Comfortable. <laughs> so the, these, these, these men figured, well, we've killed two birds with one stone, and that is we got rid of Joseph. He's not going to rule over us. I mean, how can a servant end up ruling over us anyway? So, hey, we've got a good deal. You know, we're not going to be guilty, and we'll just tell the old man that he has uh, befallen by some wild animal. Um, the um, probably didn't think the life expectancy <laughs> of a slave would be very long. No, I know, I know. Let's look at uh, verse twenty-eight. He says, "The Midianite men traders passed by. They drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for." 20 pieces of silver. Then they brought Joseph to Egypt. The 20 pieces of silver, because the brother sold Rachel's firstborn for 20 pieces, a 20 silver uh, dinarim, which is equal to five shekelim, uh, he redeemed our firstborn sons for the amount as the atonement for the misdeed of our ancestors. To this day, the firstborn of a family uh, male is, is redeemed by, those, by the same deal. How is that done today? 
Uh, the, there, there, is there still shekels mm-hmm. in Israel? Yeah. Okay. How do, how do they and that? well, what happens is right at the time I think it's right around their circumcision time, right? They take the take uh, the coins and they bring it and uh, they bring it to the to the rabbi that's going to be doing the mm-hmm. the bris. It's a pretty interesting concept how how that happens. Still happens to this day. Is that the national currency? Mm-hmm. The, the shekel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. The what? The redemption is only with the first son. That's what I said. Yeah, you did. I was just thinking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the firstborn son. I was thinking of the brisket like you and I said, we didn't see that, but it wasn't the firstborn son. Right, right, right. Very good. Um, Let's see. The brothers proclaimed a solemn ban forbidding anyone to divulge to Jacob what had occurred, according to the uh, Sefer Hasidim, uh, the, the... The oath applied even to Joseph and promoted, uh, prohibited him from attempting to return to Yaakov and even to notify him of, of word of mouth or letter and of his whereabouts without consent. This would explain why Joseph never made an attempt, even after he became in power, or, you know, was received power that he did, didn't notify his father. That was always a mystery to me. Why didn't he do that? But this oath was a very strong oath, and we know that if you make an oath, you're not supposed to break an oath. Um, the question here is, why were the brothers of one, uh, the, the ones who made Joseph suffer? The hand of heaven was at work in the cell of Joseph. The brothers thought he was a uh, uh, menace to them, and the unity and destiny of the family they thought that they would kill him, and a dead man could not reign. They thought that they would make him a slave, and a slave cannot reign. But God, through, uh, through otherwise, Joseph would be king no matter what they did. The sages teach our father Yaakov would have had to descend to Egypt in chains and a collar, saith God. He is my firstborn son. Shall I bring him down there in the dis- in disgrace? Rather, I will lead his sons before him, and he will be forced to descend after him. The idea is that anyone that ascends to the highest level also has a period of dissension or lowering themselves. Look at David Amalek, who before becoming king, he was anointed when he was a young man. And look at the, the trials and difficulties went to. I mean, he came within fractions of his own death. I mean, think about having a spear thrown at you while you're playing the harp for the king. It's unbelievable. So how uh, imaginatively discouraging it would have been for David to realize, I was anointed king. I'm supposed to be the king. Now I have to trust God because other than that, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. I mean, he had mercenaries hunting him down. The king had people literally chasing him down all over Judea and Samaria, trying to find him. Uh, and thank God, obviously, they didn't. So this is all part of, of, of that deal. Um, the fourth Aliyah, the story of Joseph, is interrupted by the episode of Judah and Tamar. Judah married the daughter of a local businessman and had three sons. His first son, Er, married a woman and named may name Tamar, but died soon thereafter. Judah was the second son. Onan married Tamar and thus fulfilled the mitzvah of Yibim, Yib, uh, Yibum, uh, but he too died childless. Judah hesitated to give his third son Tamar to Tamar, so he returned to her father's home, and Judah's wife then died. After Judah's wife died, he embarked on a business trip, and during the business trip, decided to hook up. <laughs> yes, that's why bring your wife on a business trip is the best thing. But his wife was dead, even in the old days. So he went on the business trip. Tamar had something. No, she she was not straight up with it as either. She enticed him. She she owned some of the responsibility. She wasn't a victim here, okay? She she was trying to. No, but she's she's the righteous she one here. I know she's the righteous one. And it says in the commentary yeah. that she I didn't say she was unrighteous by doing that. Daughter of Shem. Right. Yeah. Be careful, right. you're outnumbered. 
<laughs> Caleb, help me. Notice the two men are sitting uh, the, it, at, the at, the at the head of the table. Yeah. yeah. Division. Right, right, right. Surrounding. Yes, Caleb, you might have to escort me out after. I was not intimating at all that she was no, you had a, a, smile on your a negative personality. No, she was being absolutely righteous. This is the thing. We know the Mashiach comes out of her, the birth of these twins. She, she wanted to be part of the family. I mean, look, Ruth is an example of which is later going to become part of this whole story. But Ruth is an example of someone who says, I want to be a part of the Jewish people, and whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. And she, she knew deep down inside that this was her destiny, and she knew that it was a part of that. Should, should uh, Judah have followed through with his, his uh, task to make sure that she was able to give birth to a child? Yes. It just didn't happen the way they expected once again, something that is going to be elevated as high as Mashiach, and the, and the first, obviously, Mashiach is David and Melech, who is anointed by the king, who comes out of this lineage, has to start at the lowest level. I, that's some of the things that we just, that's the biblical prescription for everything. Anything that reaches the highest level has to go to its lowest level before. And it's amazing how many stories like this are in the line of Mashiach. You have Lot and his daughters. I mean, you just go down through the list and you think, oh my goodness, you would think that the soon redeemer of the Jewish people and the, that he, the man that is going to bring in the Messianic era has to be a king that has no flaws in his, in his history. But that's not the case at all, right? So Potiphar, I mean, uh, uh, Tamar becomes pregnant. We know the story. Later on, when it's obvious she's pregnant, she's brought up on charges of prostitution by the rest of the family. Uh, why prostitution? Because clearly the family says, look, you're part of the family, even though you're living with your father, but your husbands are dead and you're pregnant. So she then commences to send some items to Judah and he realized, whoop, I've been caught. Right? Now, it is through his honesty, though, and his righteousness to admit to this, this tragedy that he brings salvation and ultimately will bring salvation to the, to the whole world. Redemption will come at the hand of the act of a righteous man. And once again, we see the fulcrum point of everything about redemption rest on the actions of one individual. It's a powerful thing to realize how important it is for each one of us to act at the highest level of morality and the right decision making at all times. Uh, anything, any questions on this Aliyah that you wanted to bring up? Not a question, but a comment, and I, I read it, I think in this um, commentary, that she was actually being taken out to be burned. Mm -hmm. And it says, as she was being taken out, then she said, who's ever this, these belong right. to she, these She was willing, and, right. But she was so righteous that she was not she was willing to go to right. her death rather than humiliate Judah Correct. in public. Correct. She didn't say these belong to Judah. Oh no. He's the father. No. She left And she she, she realized that he could have easily said I, I don't know what this means. Yeah. Just she put her away. Have kept quiet and went on. Amazing. You're absolutely right. Uh Kabbalistically the name Perez and Zara uh is obviously the name of the two boys that are born uh, to Tamar, great mystical significance. Zerah literally means shining in brightness, alludes to the sun, which is the source of constant light. Perez, on the other hand, means breach, alluding to the moon, whose light is sometimes whole and sometimes breached. As its lights wanes and waxes, it would be, it had been logical for the brilliant con, uh, con, constant Zerah to be born first, but God wanted Perez to be the firstborn to symbolize the divinic kingdom, which was liked, likened to the moon because it became diminished and finally disappeared like the moon. It will reemerge and grow to fullness again because of its similarities between the divinic dynasty and the moon. And the sages sent, uh, uh, sent word that the new moon had been declared, Rosh Hashanah, they used, message, uh, they used the message 
David, the king of Israel, lives and exists, according to Rambam. Judah named the child Perez, meaning strength. Rashi on a, um, uh, uses the term breaking forth because of what the midwife had said. Um, beautiful, beautiful lesson there. Okay, so let's go to the fourth Aliyah, the story of Joseph's inter interrupted by this episode. Wait, no, the fifth. Thank you very much. Turn over to the next page. Uh, we return to the story of Joseph, who was serving Potiphar's home. God was in uh, with Joseph. He succeeded in all of his endeavors. When Potiphar took note of the fact, he put Joseph in t charge of his entire home. Not sure the, the time period, but it was very quickly he raised, was raised to the, to the top level. Uh, being a young man who was schooled in the languages uh, of, of the world, all of the great secrets that were passed down from Adam uh, to, to Noah, to Shem and Aver, all of these great secrets that were passed from Abraham down to Isaac, which is grandfather, and Yaakov, he goes into Egypt with this vast knowledge of, of the world and the mysteries of the world, and therefore uh, was able to solve problems that Anybody that was, that was, it was almost like having a, a king or a prince to be the head of your household. It was an amazing opportunity, not only for Joseph, but Potiphar. And uh, Joseph um, is pursued by Potiphar's wife, and he is a very good-looking young man. And because he continually rejected her, um, and it says in the story that no one was in the home. I mean, she, he was by himself with her. Big mistake. But, you know, that's where uh, we find now in Orthodox Judaism, a man does not stay alone or be alone with another woman. It's just, you just create a problem. Uh, that Joseph um, uh, is advanced to his wife. This is the sixth Aliyah. He steadfastly rebuffed her. Eventually she... Uh, libeled him and told her husband that he had tried to make advances to her. This finds him in prison. Um, God was still with Joseph, however, and he found favor in the eyes of the prison warrant who put him in charge of all the prisoners. Wow, this guy just cannot keep from being in a leadership position. What do you think was the, what are some of the leadership qualities you think Joseph had that kept, kept him in charge? Not only God smiling on him, but Think of some leadership qualities and just, just knowing his actions so far. Dream say again? Dream uh, you know, wisdom. Let's say great wisdom. He had, foreseeing right, foreseeing the future, right. great wisdom. Okay, that's one. I think he had charisma. Absolutely. I'm sure he had charisma. Good looking man. He was strong. Um, he, he, knew, he knew his place in the world. And I, I think not only uh, charisma, but confidence, probably a strong level of confidence exuded his, his behavior. And I so it's, judged favorably. I, absolutely. He was very, think, think about, now that's a very good point. Why, why would you say that? Because you remember when the, the bread maker and the uh, cup bearer is thrown in prison, what's Joseph's response? Why, why do you have downcast face? I mean, what's wrong? I mean, here he's a guy being a, compassionate man, not a, a capo, not a thug, you know, to, but to torture. If anything, anybody in that position he had would have used as an opportunity to push people down and to gain himself to a higher level. Instead, he looks at these guys and says, why, why the downcast face? Why do you look so, so, uh, so bad? So these leadership qualities that he exhibited are good leadership qualities for anyone who wants to succeed in life, having compassion for other people, being strong, in, uh, in your character, uh, having great wisdom, to be able to know and, and to analyze information and process it and make wise decisions. These are very important parts. Also, having integrity. I mean, this man had incredible integrity. The seventh Aliyah says, two of Pharaoh's officers, the butler and the baker, aroused, uh, were aroused the royal uh, ire and were cast into prison. The same one that Joseph was now administering. One night they both had odd dreams, and Joseph interpreted them, and Joseph told the butler that he'd soon be released and restored to Pharaoh's service. The baker was told by Joseph that he would soon be hung. Joseph pleaded with the butler 
to mention his plight to Pharaoh and asked for his release three days later. Both Joseph, Joseph's interpretations came true. Uh, that would be really odd to be in Joseph's situation where you have to tell a guy, yeah, your dream is not that good. <laughs> You're going to die. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how do, you, how do you deal with that, but obviously it was not a good situation. We, we, mentioned, about, we mentioned this the other day that the cupbearer forgot Joseph. And we asked the question, well, did, did he forget or did he just conveniently say, I'm not going to act like I know this guy in prison still because what benefit would it have for him? Yeah. Right, yeah, that's what I'm saying. God calls him to dislike for He just doesn't even think about it anymore. Uh, why does God call him to, to forget, according to your studies? What did you find out? Right, he counted on man rather than God. Now you'd say, "Wow, that's that's a pretty, you know, difficult judgment from the Creator." But understand that a tzaddik is judged at a different level than the rest of us are. Maybe some of us could have gotten away with that and not had that situation. But a great tzaddik, uh, things happen to them, judgments happen to them because there are expectations of their behavior and actions that are much higher than the average person. So. It is something to to consider. Uh, yes, we learned Sunday uh, in the Sunday class that one thing. Rabbi that, Wolby's class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That uh, the reason these two two people accepted Joseph's interpretation of their dreams that each one the cupbearer had been given the interpretation of the baker's dream. And the, and the baker had been given the interpretation of the cupbearer's dream. So when Joseph interpreted it in the same way, right. that was a sign that what Joseph is right, It must be true. Is right. true. Very good. That's good. That's a good, very good point. Um, I'm trying to see here. This is... Um, Uh, yeah, yeah. Verse sixteen is where you say it saw that he had interpreted well. Um, I guess that's what that's referring to. Yeah, that's exactly verse sixteen. It says the implication is that the baker had not planned to tell his dream to Joseph, but when he saw that the interpretation of his colleague's dream was logical, mm -hmm. it, it says he ch he changed his mind, or it may be that he changed his mind when he heard that Joseph had interpreted the dream in favorable uh, manner, and he hoped that the similar cheerful interpretation would have been his own, but it wasn't. So, um, any, any comments or questions you have about the text before we close out for the day?